All right. Looks like we have everyone in. Um, welcome to this fantastic panel. Very excited for this webinar. Uh, my name is Dan Kramer. I'm a personal injury trial lawyer on the plaintiff side in Century City. I'm also chair of the Beverly Hills Bar Association's personal injury section. And again, we have a fantastic panel here. We're going to teach you all how to be amazing settlement officers so that we can get this huge backlog of personal injury cases settled, move through the courts so that the cases that need to be tried can. Um, we have two judges here with us today. I wanna first introduce Judge Dahlia Lyons, who is on the Judicial Council for the trial courts. She is also the um, supervi Assistant Supervising Judge for the Civil Division. She was appointed in 2005, and prior to working as a judge, she was an entertainment lawyer and then became the chief legal advisor for the L.A. County Sheriff, and she currently runs the MSC program for L.A. County. So, Judge Lyons, it's amazing to have you here. Thanks for being here. We also have Judge Daniel Crowley, who was appointed in 2018. He is currently the supervising judge for the PI Hub, um, does great work with the thousands and thousands of cases we have in the hub currently. He was former, formerly the managing partner at Booth, Mitchell and & Strange. And I actually had a case with him right before he became a judge, huge case. I think it settled for a whopping five figures, but uh, Judge Crowley was amazing to work with, true gentleman, and we're honored to have him here. We also have uh, Jeannie Harrison, who is double billing right now, um, doing a mediation while she's also teaching this webinar. So. She truly can do it all. She is uh, the president of CALA, really doing amazing work right now, um, generally for CALA, but also on the paraprofessional and non-lawyer ownership uh, that the state bar and some people are trying to pass through. She's putting up a great fight there. Um, she's a top employment plaintiff trial lawyer. We're very lucky to have her. And just recently, she was honored by the defense bar, which is a big deal for any plaintiff's lawyer, to be uh, in the Hall of Fame as a civil advocate. So congrats to Jeannie. Really lucky to have her. Her and Marta have worked so hard to put together this whole program. And it really is, I, I've done a couple of webinars with Jeannie and Marta, um, who's the president elect of ASCDC. And it's amazing to see these two, you know, pillars of the plaintiff and defense bar come together and work so well together to help us all move cases. So we're honored to have both of them. So Marta is, like I said, she's a partner at Roby Mathai. She does, uh, she defends lawyers when they get sued, does uh, legal malpractice. She is the president elect of ASCDC and she is one of the originators of this program and has worked very closely with Jeannie. And it's great to see how they're great friends because like I said, they're leaders on both sides of the V. Um, so we're honored to have you both. Last but not least, we have my good friend, Michael Schoenbach, who has been president of every organization since he was in elementary school, yes. uh, was president of his fraternity, president of ABOTA, president of ASCDC. He's going to be president of his retirement home. I'm sure of it uh, when he's done practicing law, if he ever does. But uh, he's a great friend. He's a mentor of mine, a fantastic trial lawyer. He is the defense go to when big money's on the line. He's Bet Your Corporation guy um, is a fantastic trial lawyer, good friend. We're lucky to have him. So what we want to do is we have all these fantastic panelists. We have an hour and a half. We're going to basically show you from top to bottom how to be a settlement officer, how to settle cases. Like I said, get through the backlog. We're going to walk you through step by step how to logistically do it when you sign on to the virtual program. Um, and then Judge Lyons, Mike Schoenbach, and myself are going to give some tips on how to get these cases settled. If you've never acted as a mediator before, or you've only done it a few times, we're going to give you some tips on ways that you can kind of break the barrier and, and actually get cases to resolution. So without any further ado, um, Judge Crowley, why don't you kind of give us uh, some background on this program, how it works, how it originated, and how we can all work through it. All right, thank you. Um, and I, I'm very honored to be here with all of you because this is uh, quite an esteemed panel. Uh, back in the day, long, long, long time ago, pre-COVID, we used to have a joint settlement officer program 
where members of the Association of Southern California Defense Council, members of CALA, and members of ABOTA would all volunteer as uh, settlement officers. And what that meant was that on a given date and time, you would show up in one of the five PI hub courts here, uh, initially over in Moss, but then here at Spring Street, and you would go in and check in with the clerk and the clerk would say, who are you and why are you here? And you'd have to explain that you were there as a settlement officer and find your parties. And then you would take them down to one of the attorney conference rooms down on the second floor and you'd be in this tight little space and work to get the case settled. When COVID hit, all of that stopped. So we didn't have any sort of MSC program other than the court's MSC program, which is very limited. So uh, Marta and Jeannie put their heads together and figured out that there was a need and they had uh, something to fill that need, which is this virtual program. And it's hosted by the Beverly Hills Bar Association, who has a foundation who offered the money up to fund the platform on which this takes place. And then Marta and Jeannie have put together a program now where you all can sign up and be volunteers and when you sign up, you will get uh, email or text reminders, however you wish, uh, to remind you of when and where you're supposed to be on a Zoom call. The attorneys will be doing, the, the attorneys representing the litigants will be doing the same thing. Um, and it's, it's really just an amazing program. I'm so in awe of, of what Marta and Jeannie have, have put together. It's, uh, I think it's, it's the new paradigm. Uh, truly. So what we do in the PI Hub is um, historically, well, not historically, but as of now, what we are doing is we're, we are waiting for you to get ready for your case. We, we want you at your final status conference. We want you to have all your trial documents together. And the reason we're doing this is because all of you who are out there uh, watching this um, are volunteers and we don't want to waste your time. So we don't want to send cases to you where the attorneys are just thinking, you know, I'm thinking about settling, but I haven't really explored the notion. So, you know, maybe you can help me, settlement officer. We, we don't want that to happen. We want cases where the people are ready to go. So we're waiting until the MSC. We're waiting until all their trial documents are ready. And then we are ordering them to, to the MSC. Now, initially, we weren't sure how soon people could get to an MSC, so we would then continue the trial date out a month or two to allow the MSC to happen. Now, all the judges have access to the calendar, and I can look ahead and see, for example, I know that we've got an MSC available tomorrow, and I think on Monday, there may be one, on Tuesday, there are two. Uh, and there are actually a dates between now and 14 days from now, which is when the trial on a case today for an MS or a final status conference would be set. So I'm ordering people to go to the MSC and I'm leaving their trial date intact to put a little pressure on the parties to get it, get it done. Because uh, the other thing I don't want to happen is you go to an MSC tomorrow, but your trial's not for two months. So I was like, yeah, I'm not really ready yet. Um, I am vetting the cases, however, all of us are. We, uh, at the, the final status conference, we'll ask the parties, all right, what, what was the mechanism of injury? Was it a car crash? Is it a slip and fall? How did this happen? What are the plaintiff's injuries? Kind of describe them generally. Um, what are the specials involved? Is, has there been a demand? Has there been an offer? I, will this be fruitful, counsel? Is there any reason not to send you to an MSC? Have you had a mediation recently? So again, trying to be cognizant of not wasting volunteer settlement officers time. If a case is just not gonna settle and we can tell it's not gonna settle, we won't send it to the MSC program. Um, but, but sometimes even though counsel will kind of, you know, puff a little bit and say, well, no, you know, I've made my best and final, Your Honor. We're, if, if they're not going to pay what we're demanding, I'm not going to sell you. Well, how far apart are you? Well, we're $7,500 apart, Your Honor. You know, guess what? You're going to the MSC. Um, we are developing a program where we're going to allow parties, people have asked, can we go to an MSC even though we're not at your final status conference? And, and up till now, the answer has been no. We want you to have your case crystallized. But we realize that we have capacity in the system. We have a lot of volunteers. We have slots that are not being used. 
And so what we've elected to do is create an ex party application program or process rather, where counsel for both sides get together and fill out a, a stipulation that they've, they've talked about an MSC with each other. They think it's meaningful. The plaintiff has made a demand. It doesn't have to, the form doesn't require you to tell us how much. The defendant has made an offer. You don't have to tell us how much. Both sides are willing to move from that offer and they feel, feel that a MSC would be meaningful. Then those parties will come in front of me or one of my colleagues and we will vet them and make sure that really is going to be fruitful. And if we think it is, we will in the future order cases to MSC before their final status conference. But again, we're gonna vet it for you so that we're not wasting your time. Um, so I think that's pretty much everything, uh, Dan, you asked me to cover. So I'll turn it back to you. Oh, great work. Um, okay, so let me actually turn it over now to the founders of this uh, program, Jeannie and Marta, to walk us through or walk our audience through exactly what they need to do to get, get going on this. Thank you, Judge Crowley, for that introduction. And thank you for saying such wonderful things about the program. It is really a great program. And I also wanna emphasize that it's free for the litigants. So we are providing a free services, actually the settlement officers who are volunteering their time are creating a free service for the litigants to try to get this uh -huh. case resolved. And they are volunteering three hours of their time. And just so you know, the, the, the system is working as designed and over 35% of the cases that have thus far been ordered into the program have settled. And an, an additional 30% of the cases, the parties are continuing to discuss settlement. So we've had great success Due, in, due entirely to the efforts of the settlement officers who are, who are giving up their, their time to get these cases resolved. Jeannie, is there anything you'd like to add before we start? I, I, I just wanna say again, thanks to everybody who is on this panel and thanks to all of the settlement officers and to every single one of you who is attending this webinar wanting to find out how you can act as a settlement officer, how does the program function? And even, you know, if some of you are considering potentially, um, you know, the stipulation and ex parte application that Judge Crowley addressed and potentially getting some of your cases into the program, I, I want to reiterate, you know, that this works. And so when you work together um, as settlement officers with a, a, a plaintiff or defense attorney across the, you know, someone from the other side of the V and you work together to try to help the parties come to a resolution, um, it, it's, it's a very functional, amazing process that you're able to do virtually. The parties, their representatives really appreciate being able to do this virtually. And um, we have received fantastic feedback in that regard, even on a case where Marta and I worked as the settlement officers. Um, and so a general counsel for the company uh, involved in one of the companies involved in that case was able to attend, obviously, virtually from um, the Midwest. And uh, he was very appreciative. So I want to encourage all of you that this is this program is a real time saver in terms of the way it's set up now um, and that people don't have to schlep down to um, East Spring Street and don't have to fly in for that, et cetera, et cetera. It's very effective and it's also seamless. It works very well. We're going to show you right now how to get to it. All right. Well, we have Jose Torres, who is with us today, who's going to help us. Uh, with a PowerPoint presentation. He's also going to present a video that will show uh, potential settlement officers uh, how to move through the program as well. And Jose has been a fantastic partner in this program. He's with PESC, and they have been uh, really fantastic to work, uh, work with in building this website and making it, uh, giving it the functionality that it has. Uh, so Jose, could you pull up uh, the PowerPoint, please? And while Jose's doing that, I just want to put a pin in this. Jose is the dude who writes the code, okay? <laughs> so everybody give him a big round of applause and uh, even at your desk. So uh, this is one of the geniuses behind this program. 
and and as you know, we have Jeannie and I when working together. Uh, you know, when we've gotten comments in real time from settlement officers or from counsel for the parties about the functionality of the program, we've been able to call up Jose or send him an email and they, he's, he's right on it. I mean, he is in real time making great adjustments and making the program even more, uh, you know, functional for all the parties that are going to be using it. Okay, so jumping in here. This um, first slide is what you are going to see when you are registering for as a settlement officer. And so you're going to go to the resolvelawla.com website and you're going to click a button that says settlement officer registration and it will take you to this page. And you are going to input um, your, you know, your primary and secondary emails and phone numbers. And you can also put in... Um, uh, uh, if your phone, if you want the text notifications, put in your cell phone number, and then you will be able to get text notifications about the MSCs. Your secondary phone numbers and secondary email uh, uh, fields can be used if you want to give that, uh, you know, for your assistant or your paralegal or somebody else within your office um, or your personal email account, something like that, if you want to make sure to get notifications there. You also are going to have to input your state bar number because the system is going to check to see if you are a licensed attorney within the state of California. So, um, and that will happen automatically. And, uh, and when you're doing this, if you see at the top of the screen where it says sign up type, you can, you, you can toggle settlement officer and you can, or attorney for party, or you can toggle for both. So if you are registering as a settlement attorney, excuse me, a settlement officer, but you also may be uh, ordered into the program or you one of your cases has been ordered into the program, you can register as both as you are doing this. And, and Marta, I do wanna say also, not just can register as both, but you should. You should register as both if in fact, um, you are registering as a settlement officer and it's possible that one of your cases could ultimately get into this program as well, a case on which you're acting as an attorney. Yes. Okay, next slide, Jose, please. And just to be clear, you don't have to just be a PI lawyer. Someone asks, you can be any type of lawyer. Is that correct? Yes, as a settlement officer, we uh, right now, if you're a member of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, ABODA, uh, ASCDC, or CALA, you can be a settlement officer. We would we are asking that, that these uh, settlement officers have at least ten years of litigation experience. However, so the parties and uh, their attorney and their representatives know that the, that their settlement officers are well versed in litigation and the settlement process and can really, you know, strong arm settlements and get them done. Okay, so the next, this page uh, is the settlement officer registration. This is what's gonna happen after you put in your information, your name and your email and your state bar number. So when you put in your contact information, you're gonna get an email and you're going to have to click the link and log, and then when you click that link, you're going to have to log in and set a password. So, um, and we just caution you that sometimes uh, law firms have pretty aggressive spam filters. I know mine does. So make sure you check your junk email just to make sure that you get that uh, confirmation email in order to set your password. Uh, next. Um, you are going to go to the MSC duty scheduler page. And there you will have a count there. There's your calendar and your and you can look through just page through the different dates on the calendar and note your availability to serve as a settlement officer. If you click on a time, it will turn green. If you no long, if, and then if you say, if you look at your calendar, glance back at it and say, oh, wait, I'm not available at that time. I have a depot, I have a court appearance or something like that. Just click it again and that will remove your availability. And that's as easy as it gets. So um, it, when, so, and that's, and, and what we, what we want you to do is go forward several months and look in your calendar and see when you can serve. And you will get notified if, if in fact, you're not going to be serving 
as a settlement officer on a date that you indicated that you were available, you will get notified at least 24 hours in advance that you were, you know, there's no MSC or you're not, you know, you don't have to serve on that date. So you will get notified. And so you can then release your date and go about your business. The, and just so you know, they are three hour blocks. They go from nine to noon and 1.30 to 4.30. Jeannie, is there anything else you wanna add here? Yes, I just wanna say, please do go ahead and input as much availability as you have um, because we are expanding the program as Judge Crowley indicated we're gonna have more cases coming into the uh, virtual MSC pipeline. And so we need all the availability that you have. And we already have um, a number of individuals who have done half a dozen, uh, half a dozen MSCs because they enjoy it. And so um, it's, it's a really rewarding experience. Um, go ahead and schedule yourself for as, as many options, as many times and dates as, as you have available on your calendar. If something comes up, and we're going to talk about that, uh, you know, if if you, if an MSC has been assigned to you, if something comes up, you're able to let us know that you have to cancel. We then have to go through a process of trying to find a replacement officer, settlement officer for you. But that is something that is possible. We know that life happens, and sometimes you're busy professionals, and you have to do something else. So. You are able then to cancel after a specific MSC has been assigned to you in case of an emergency, in case of need. Um, and you will be notified, again, of each one of these uh, dates and times by uh, email or text. So go ahead, Marta. So, sorry, uh, Jeannie and Marta. Someone just asked, will there be enough time to run a conflicts check before agreeing to handle an MSC? Or is that Absolutely. Okay. Yes, and you will. We will see this in the in the PowerPoint presentation, or excuse me, the video presentation that's coming up. You must run in order to even uh, click the button to start the MSC. You must perform a conflicts check, or you will not be allowed to start the MSC. So there is definitely time for you to do so when you're assigned the case. Please, at that point in time, is when you should go back into your Resolve Law account log in and go to uh, your, uh, your duty, your, your particular dashboard. You will see the case there. You will get all the details as to the party's names. All the, uh, all the information should be there for, for you to, to uh, uh, do a comprehensive conflict check before you agree to take on the case. And if you are not, please notify uh, the Resolve Lots, uh, there's, a, there's information on the website in which you can send a quick email and let the people know that you are not able to serve. Okay, that was a great question, thank you. Um, okay, so moving on, this is the, the page that you will see for the attorney for the party registration. So once an attorney is ordered, a case is ordered into the program, the plaintiff's counsel is gonna be directed to the Resolve Law LA website and go to a button that says, you know, a, a attorney for party registration, and this, this page will, be, will pop up. And it looks exactly like the settlement officer page, and you're gonna put in the exact same information, um, you know, your name, last name, and, your, and how you wanna be contacted, phone, email, and text message if, if you wish to. Next page. And again, you're gonna get the same type of uh, notification uh, that we went through for the settlement officer. So you are also going to get an email with a, a link that you're, going to, uh, that you're going to click on and you're gonna set up a password. You're gonna enter your name, email, and a password for your specific personalized account for the Resolve Law program. And then you're gonna to go to your dashboard. Once that is com completed, you will go to your dashboard. And then you'll see the button there that says register new case. So when you click on that, you will see this uh, page pop up and you are going to fill in all the information on, the, on each line. And um, that, that, that information includes the case name, the case number, the trial date, 
Um, and the trial date's important because when you go to schedule your MSC, the dates available for your MSC are the only ones in between your trial date and the, you know, the date that you're registering <clears throat> the case for the MSC. So it's important to give very complete information um, when you get here. You're also going to have to um, identify the name of the PI judge that ordered you into the program, the department, and the date you were ordered uh, um, into the MSC. And then you, the information from there is your, you know, the name of the plaintiff. You need uh, you need contact information for the plaintiff. You need contact information for the defendant, the defendant's uh, counsel. And all, so you need to be very complete and precise when you complete this information. And um, if you are able to get this information complete, um, when you, when the MSC actually begins, some of that, if you, the, the parties will be automatically put into breakout rooms. For example, the plaintiff and the plaintiff's attorney, if that information is complete upon the registration on this page, they will be automatically placed into that breakout room. So then when the settlement officers begin the MSC, they're already in that breakout room. The, and, and if the, that information is not complete, then it's simple enough, the settlement officers just have to place people into the appropriate room. Um, and uh, I think that's it for this page. Jeannie, do you have anything else? No, I, I just want to say that it is the plaintiff's attorney who is registering the case and the plaintiff's attorney will need to have conferred with defense counsel to obtain, number one, all of the available dates for MSC because the plaintiff's attorney is going to need to be scheduling the case for the MSC and also all of the contact information for everybody on the defense side, which includes the insurance carrier representative. So you need to have all the names, the contact information, and be prepared to input all of that information when you're registering the case. Thank you, Marta. Great. Jose, can we go to the next page? Okay, great. So this is going to be after you register all that information, um, you're going to schedule the MSC and you're going to add your, uh, when you, after you've completed your MSC brief, it's from this case, from, from this case specific case where you'll see add a document where you can um, uh, add your MSC brief that is confidential and nobody, the only the settlement officers will see the MSC brief that you submit to the Resolve Law website. So it is confidential. If in fact you want to share, the parties want to share their MSC briefs, then they can do so. You just have to email it to your, you know, your opposing counsel. But and, just, just to assure you, they are confidential. And so, and Marta, just to jump on there too, to the settlement officers, this is the process that the plaintiff's attorney and defense attorney go through to upload the mediation briefs. And once uploaded, those briefs are going to be available to you, the settlement officers who are assigned to the case. They're going to be available to you through your dashboard when you click on this particular case that is set. And you'll be able to download those MSC briefs. Um, and read them. So this is the this is how those briefs get into the system, and uh, you know how you will go in and, and obtain them. I think we have to get to that video too, right? Yes, we do. <laughs> so um, if you need to cancel a case and reschedule the MSC, or if the case settles before the MSC, which is always good news. This when you will you'll go to the page on your dashboard for this particular case, and if you scroll down to the bottom after your after you know the case documents where you upload your briefs, you see that red button that says cancel scheduled MSC, and when you do that, cancellation notices will be automatically sent out to everybody in, that has been registered, um, you know, earlier on that earlier page. So, um, and if the MSC it has to be rescheduled, then you have to go back in and pick a date. The case has already been has already been registered, so you don't have to go back through and do you know re-input all that data. You just have to pick a new date. But obviously, you're going to have to meet and confer with your uh, with defense counsel because plaintiffs counsel is the one who's canceling. That they're the only ones that can. 
So you're going to have to meet and confer with defense counsel before you do that and obviously pick a mutually convenient date before your trial date and, and schedule it that way. Right. And just to highlight, the settlement officers cannot actually cancel an MSC. Only the plaintiff's attorney can cancel the MSC if the settlement officer needs to reschedule because they will no longer be available to uh, work on a specific case on a specific date and time. Then the settlement officer needs to inform Resolve Law LA um, admin staff through info at resolvelawla.com and say, I'm no longer available. Please take me off this case. That will then trigger us to find a new settlement officer on whichever side, whether it's the plaintiff settlement officer or defense, um, to fill in uh, as a result of your inability to work on the case. Okay. Great. And I think we have the tutorial. Yes, we do. So um, this tutorial that we're about to show you is going to be live on the Resolve Law website very soon. And if it's not up already. But this is an excellent and, and way to go, Jose and his team at PESC for putting this together for us. But it will give you a visual demonstration and walk you through as a settlement officer, all, everything you need to know about this process. Hi, I'm Jose Torres with Resolve Law Los Angeles. And today I'm going to give you guys a quick tutorial on how to use a site and Zoom to conduct a virtual MSC. We're going to start off by assuming that you've already added availability through the MSC duty scheduler and you have received an email notification letting you know that you have been assigned to a case. That email notification will look something like this. You will see the, the name of the case here, the case number, and you'll also see when the case is scheduled for. You'll see a link here. This link, if clicked will take you to the dashboard of the website where you will see the details of the case. You can always access the case by logging into the website and viewing the dashboard. From the dashboard you'll see that there is an area for current and upcoming cases and cases that are in the past. Notice that the case has the date and time of the MSC and whether or not you have completed a conflict check. If you have completed the conflict check, which is required, you'll see a checkbox in this area right here. You'll also see this Join MSC button. This Join MSC button is only available 15 minutes prior to the start of the MSC. Click on the case name to view more details. At the top, you'll see a reminder of the case date and time right here. You'll also see a notice letting you know that you need to complete a conflict check up here. It's important that a conflict check is performed and that you clear the notice by clicking the button. If you do not clear the conflict check, the join button will not allow you into the meeting. If you have a conflict, it's important that you contact us so the case can be reassigned. Hopefully this can be done sooner rather than later so we can give the new settlement officer plenty of time to review the case and complete the conflict check. In the top section, you'll see some details about the case. Lower on the page, you'll see the names of the attorneys and parties on the case. On the case registration process, we have asked all the parties to be entered, including insurance reps. You'll have to review these names for your conflict check. In this area here, you'll see the names of both settlement officers. You might find it useful to communicate beforehand. The names of the settlement officers are only available to settlement officers. It is the intent that settlement officers remain anonymous until the day of the MSC. The attorneys for the parties have been asked to upload MSC briefs. When those have been uploaded, you'll see them in this case documents area here. We're going to go up to the top now, and we're going to clear the conflict check. You'll clear the conflict check by clicking this button here. As I mentioned earlier, 15 minutes before the MSC is scheduled to start, the join button will appear. It's required that settlement officers join the MSC through the resolvelawla.com site. You will not get host privileges if you don't join through the site. We use Zoom for the virtual MSCs, and if you're familiar with hosting Zoom meetings, the rest of this will be pretty familiar to you.
Before you attempt to join the virtual MSC, you're going to want to download Zoom. The Zoom client is available at zoom.us slash download. When you're ready to join the MSC, you'll want to click on the Join MSC Video Conference button here. There's a few items on this page that you'll want to note. If at any point during the MSC you need an urgent consultation with the judge, please see this notice here. It's also prohibited to use any software or device to record the video or audio of this meeting. Recording the virtual MSC in any way is prohibited. One thing you'll also want to do is take note of the end time of the MSC. There are three hours that have been reserved for this time. There is an additional 30 minutes that has been allocated after the meeting. If you go beyond this time, the system will automatically end the meeting. The next thing you'll see is another join button. This will be the last step that you do prior to joining the actual meeting. There's a couple other items here that I'd like to note though. In this area here, you'll see the plaintiff participants. And on this side here, you'll see the defendant participants. This will be useful when admitting participants into the meeting so that you can sort them into the correct breakout room. The last thing I want to note here is this question here of whether the case was settled. After the MSC is complete, you'll want to return here and select yes, no, or continue in discussion. We're going to go ahead now and actually enter the MSC via Zoom. So we're going to go ahead and click this button. And now you'll join the meeting. From here, you'll be able to choose whether or not you're going to join the conference via phone call or computer audio. In most cases, you're going to click this button here to join with computer audio. After you join, note that your name will be identified as settlement officer. To make it easier for the other participants to know exactly who you are, you'll want to click on the participants tab here at the bottom. And on the right side here, you want to click on the more button and click the rename button. And go ahead and enter your name. The next thing we're going to want to look at is breakout rooms. Breakout rooms in Zoom are virtual rooms within the meeting that are private to only those in the room. The idea is to keep the different parties separated when needed. To access the breakout rooms, you'll want to click on the breakout rooms button here at the bottom. There will be three breakout rooms created when you join the Zoom meeting. One for the defense, one for the plaintiff, and a third breakout room for settlement officers to be able to talk privately. While there are three breakout rooms created by default, settlement officers will be able to create more rooms if needed. Breakout rooms can only be edited when they are closed, at the beginning of the meeting, they will be closed. You can edit the rooms before admitting participants. Open the breakout rooms before admitting participants. You'll want to reference the list of participants on the site as you admit participants. As they are admitted, you'll want to assign them one by one. As participants attempt to join the meeting, you'll see a notification at the top of the Zoom application. You can click the Admit button to admit them and return back to the breakout rooms window to assign them into a breakout room. As more participants join, you'll want to admit them and assign them to their breakout room. We're currently in the lobby of the Zoom meeting, and you'll notice that in the participants list, I'm the only one that's listed here. As a settlement officer, you'll be able to move around the different breakout rooms. You'll want to click the Join button next to the room that you want to move to. We're now in the Plaintiff Breakout Room. Note that the Plaintiff Participant that we admitted earlier is listed here on the right side, along with our listing. This is because 
the participants list is unique to the breakout room that you're currently in. Additionally, if you use the chat feature, it's only available to those in that specific breakout room. Now we're going to go ahead and click on the breakout room button at the bottom and join the defendant breakout room. We are now in the defendant breakout room. If you click on the participants button at the bottom, you'll notice again the only people listed in the defendant's breakout room are those in this particular breakout room. If you and the other settlement officer need to discuss privately, you'll both want to open up the breakout room window and join the settlement officer's breakout room. After completing the MSC, you'll want to go back to the Resolve Law LA website and note if the case settled. There will be a few other questions that we'd like for you to fill out. When you're done with the form, click the Save button at the bottom. You've now completed the MSC. We want to thank you for volunteering and encourage you to update the MSC duty scheduler with upcoming availability. Thank you. All right. Amazing stuff. Very well done. Jeannie and Marta, anything else from the start to finish that you want to go over? I think that's it. From my perspective, just please volunteer. Get on. This is easy to do. You'll be really comfortable with the process. You can watch that video as many times as you need to. And uh, we really appreciate your service. Absolutely. And if you run into any issues, in registering your case, registering as a settlement officer, you can send an email through the Resolve Law uh, website and the, our, the fine folks at PSC will get back to you um, within about 24 hours. So have some patience, but they will return your calls or your phone or, or emails uh, and answer your questions. And thank you for volunteering. All right, great, great presentation. Now let's get to the real meat potatoes of settling cases. Um, Judge Lyons, how often do you do MSCs? Well, uh, I do two a day. So in the uh, courts uh, MSC settlement program, we have judges that are dedicated exclusive to the uh, MSCs and we do two a day. All right, so we have a seasoned pro who does this all the time, nonstop, and we are gonna get great advice from her on how us as settlement officers can break through and get these cases done so we can click the good button when we're done with these uh, MSC programs. And Mike and I, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna kind of walk through the phases of a mediation. And we're gonna try to give you all tips and suggestions and based on our experience, me as a plaintiff's lawyer, Mike as a defense lawyer, and obviously Judge Lyons on how different strategies, different ways we get these done. But we're going to kind of walk you through from the very start. So you entered in the, the now we've entered in the Zoom, we've set up, you know, the breakout rooms, we're just starting, we're going to walk you through from there to how to get a settlement. So Judge Lyons, why don't we why don't you start us off kind of, okay, so we're here, we're, everything's ready, we're settlement officers, Mike and I are in there, and what's the best way that you find to initiate the conversation and get things going? Okay, so initiating the MSC, uh, think of it as, first of all, having actually a prepared opening statement. Uh, initiating it, take this opportunity uh, in your opening statement to uh, build rapport and credibility with the participants. Tell them a little bit about your background, about your experience, and overall demonstrate your knowledge and competence to serve as a settlement officer. Also use that opportunity to try to reduce attention to anxieties in the participants. So it's a very, very brief introductory because uh, the success of the MSC in large part will depend on your ability to connect with the participants, to build rapport, to build trust and credibility. So consider your opening statement. Of course, don't go uh, into too much detail about how fabulous you are, but very briefly, just to instill confidence in the participants in your ability to help them resolve the case. All right. So, so is that, are we, do you recommend talking to right away, just going to the plaintiff first, going to the defense first, talking to them both kind of at the same time? 
how do you how do you usually like to start out? You know, there's different approaches for different uh, cases, but generally some judges like to, or settlement officers, speak to the plaintiffs and the defendants separately, or some do it in the lobby, what's called the main room in soon. So it's uh, really a uh, personal preference uh, a lot of the uh, settlement officers prefer to speak to the council separately. So as you heard already, the uh, participants are already divided into plaintiff's room and defendant's room. So as a settlement officer, you can move around and you would, if you want to do the uh, speaking to uh, them separately, you could go to the plaintiff's room and to the defendant's room. Uh, in some cases, it is advisable not to put the parties in the same room depending on the type of case. Uh, in most cases, the plaintiff and the clients not necessarily wanna see each other. And you, your job is to build uh, 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 the ability of the parties to really feel comfortable. And if that will bring up the tension, you don't wanna put them in the same room. So I recommend you really carefully look at what the type of case is, and you will be able to tell from reading the briefs how much animosity there is between the parties or whether this is the type of case you want to put in the same room. Mike, how do you like to start it out? Who do you like to talk to first? Uh, you know, I like to talk to the plaintiff first. Uh, I just like to get, it's their case. It's their story. They initiated the lawsuit. So I'd like to find out what it's about. Uh, so I think it's important to get the story from the plaintiff first and then go to the defense. Okay. Yeah, I, I generally agree. And I, I think Judge Lyons is right. You really got to read the room. And sometimes these attorneys will not be as civil as a lot of us are, and they will not want to be in the same room. And that can also start things off on the wrong foot. So I think it's, it's really case by case. Mike, let me go back to you. So now you have decided who you're going to talk to first. You say you like to talk to the plaintiff. Um, what is that first conversation? How, obviously, you've already introduced yourself. You built up how, how great of a trial lawyer you are, all that stuff. So they should listen to you. What do you, what's the first thing you want to talk about? Well, I, let me just backtrack before I answer that. I think I want to comment more on the introduction part. I think there's two phases to the introduction. I think that it's important for the settlement officer to lay down some of the credentials, like we talked about, to let the people know, let the plaintiff know, let the insurance adjuster know. They have to know that you've got the right experience and background to be acting as the settlement officer. So I think that's important. I think when you're like Judge Lyons, you're conducting the, the settlement conference and you're a judge, I think people understand that the judge comes naturally with a certain amount of background, experience, and authority. Whereas sometimes if you're not a judge, you're a lawyer, you have to kind of show that you have that background and that experience. So I think it's important to lay that out there. Like Judge Lyons says, not to be bragging about your accomplishments and detailing every verdict you've had, but to let them know your experience and you've been there before. The second part is something we haven't talked about. It is you've got it. The people have to like you. And let me give you an example. Do you ever go to a party, a dinner, a dinner, a restaurant, whatever it is, a legal function? There are some people that you want to sit there and talk to. And there are some people that you don't. I mean, I'm just sorry to say some people are a little more entertaining than others and some are a little more annoying than others. People don't like to listen to the people that are annoying or not entertaining. So if people are not going to listen to you in the settlement conference, then you're not going to be able to get a case settled. So I think it's important for you as a settlement officer to, to get the people to like you. And once they like you and understand that you're a good person and you're trying to help them both sides, trying to get money for the plaintiff and get them some, some closure in the case, trying to get for the defense to get a proper evaluation on the case and get this thing settled and closed so they can move on because they have too many files. I think it's important first, you got to get them to like you and want to listen to you. So that's really what the way I like to start. Mike, let me just add on a couple of things there. I, I think what's even, and he's hundred percent right. I think what's even more helpful is if, you somehow connect with the other side beforehand and you can talk up like if I'm the plaintiff lawyer and I can talk up the defense attorney in those intros, almost brag on behalf of someone like Mike. I think it adds credibility for multiple reasons. It talks about how great of an attorney he is, but it's coming from the plaintiff's lawyer coming from someone else as opposed to his own mouth. So I think it's kind of a, 
a double whammy. And I think that I'd highly recommend you find out who you're joining up with. You both kind of introduce each other or piggyback. And I think you're going to get that way. The plaintiff's lawyer is going to listen to me and get, you know, trust Mike more from the defense side. So I think it's another, another avenue to do it. And also looking up who they are, where they went to college. Like Mike said, if you can have some small personal connection, they're just going to trust you more. It's just the way we're wired as human beings. So um, Judge Lyons, anything to add? Uh, another thing I think it's important to do in this introductory statement is because we have only three hours to settle the case, one of the things that and you explaining, you have to explain the process so that everyone feels comfortable, is try to use that as an opportunity to encourage reasonable and realistic demands and offers to encourage cooperative negotiations because you cannot really resolve a case in three hours if you are getting your first demand or the first offer as unreasonable. So hopefully you can uh, tell the, the participants, we have three hours, something like this, please use the time wisely. And I encourage you to really uh, provide realistic, reasonable offers so that we can co settle it within the three hours. Okay. So we, intros are done. Now, first conversation. Mike, what's the first thing you're asking the plaintiff um, in that very first conversation? Right. After the introductions and everything and, and establishing yourself, I think you, you want to, from my experience, you want to let them tell the story a little bit through the lawyer, have them tell the story so the, the plaintiff feels that they're being listened to, that you're understanding what the case is about. There could be emotions involved. There could be feelings involved. It could be physical. It could be mental. It could be both. Let them explain the story. And then at that point, my next response, of course, you want to act like, you know, a counselor. You want to be a good listener. But at some point, you have to convert that to the fact that we're going to be negotiating here. And the case is about monetary compensation. And so the, the tail end of that conversation is after that's done, I have to say, OK, well, we need to start this process here. I need to get a demand. You got to give me a monetary amount, something that I can go to the other room and start this process. So it's listening, let them tell the story, explain the conversion of the story and the incident slash injury to money. And then the fact that we're going to take this demand over and present it to the other side. Judge Lyons, you know, a, a lot of times I, I've spent personally like two hours deciding whose move it is you know, and like, you're just trying to figure that out. Tell me about how you deal with that and ambiguities in the briefs in that first conversation. I will, but let me just give you one, three things to remember in, uh, to, uh, regarding listening that was just mentioning. Remember the words active listening and three simple R's. Restate the question or the phrase, reflect and reframe. People like to be listened to, and you're, the first face of the MSC is listening. And the less you say, the more you listen. So uh, it's, they want to make sure that you understand. For example, you can say when you rephrase, Mr. Smith, did I understand you correctly that you feel ABC? So that they can see you're actually listening. Okay, now with regards to your question uh, about how do we uh, deal with... Uh, uh, the first opening question, uh, the a statement, I'm sorry. Yeah, some, some ambiguities or yeah, whose move exactly. it is right. and all that. All right. So uh, that's a good question. A lot of the times, first of all, you already have a settlement officers, two briefs. You have the plaintiffs, the defendants brief. Uh, and sometimes in the brief, they tell you we're at this negotiation and we're already negotiating. Uh, the plaintiff has demanded 100000 Defendant has offered $10,000. And you say, okay, well, that's good. Before you actually believe that's the case, make sure, not that you're not believing them, clarify that that is actually the current status of the negotiations, because they could have made a move subsequent to submitting the brief, or actually, I've had many cases where they actually disagreed. They said, no, I didn't offer 10, it was really 15. So the way to do that is I put the attorneys together in the same breakout room. As you know, you have the ability to move them to the settlement officers room. That's one of the beauties of the breakout rooms for Zoom. So you put both attorneys and say, okay, counsel, let me clarify. Is this where the ball is? Whose is the next move? I, I do that outside of the uh, presence of the, of the uh, clients. And then you clarify whose move is next. And basically you put them in the same room so that in case there's any ambiguity, 
or a disagreement, you can hash that out. And then of course you uh, go to the next room to get the next move. Okay. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about dealing with clients. Cause you know, in a lot of these situations you'll have, like we talked about the plaintiff, the actual injured party, and then the attorney on the other side, you're going to have the defense attorney, usually not their direct client, like the, the insured, they're going to have the adjuster, obviously. So how, and Mike, I'll start with you. How are you, do, how are you going to deal with that? Are you going to talk directly to the plaintiff? You're going to talk just to the attorney and then on the flip side with the adjuster and the defense attorney. Yeah, I think when when speaking to the plaintiff, from my perspective, uh, you are speaking to the plaintiff, but you're really speaking to the plaintiff and the attorney. And what I like to do is I like to when I'm talking to that to that group in that room, I like to talk about what I've seen in my trials and explain the risks involved in going to trial and explain how you have the opportunity to at least partially control the outcome by volunteering, you know, by being in this situation and volunteering to a settlement by agreeing to the settlement, you're participating in the process rather than having a group of uh, strangers come up with your decision. For a lot of plaintiffs, it's the only case they're ever going to have. It's their only one lawsuit. It could be a life changing event for them. And I think by giving people a little bit of control in the process through a mediation, through a settlement, a mandatory settlement conference, I think it gives them a little bit more comfort rather than uh, going through the risk of having strangers decide the outcome at trial. So I try to address that to the plaintiff. And then on the defense side, again, using my own experience, being on the defense side, I think that a lot of defense uh, clients, lawyers, and insurers will listen to me because Um, I can uh, speak from personal experience uh, with specific um, war stories or even generalities about the dangers of going to trial in a certain case and what could happen with a runaway verdict or or there's just the general risks and how they can close the file out. And if we get it settled, you know, six months from now, they're not even going to remember the name of this case. But if it goes to trial and they get banged, and there's an appeal and there's a posting a bond and all these things, they're going to remember that case for a long time. So, and not in a good way. So that's the way I, I, I start out by explaining, assuming that the, that it's appropriate to the case. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the first thing you want to do, you always want to make the attorney look really good in front of their client. Start off by saying you really are in great hands. You have the gold standard, whatever, you know, just, to, you know, you really want to make them look really good in front of their client because it'll make the attorney feel good make the client feel good. Again, these are just, you know, just tr- get them, getting them to trust you. I think from the plaintiff's perspective, I want to get a lot of clarification from the plaintiff's attorney on, are you waiving meds? Is this a non-economic damages case? Because then what I want to do with that information is I want to go talk to the adjuster. So there's any plaintiff's attorney listening here. You, we know adjusters often get, they have their equations. Uh, they put it in a program, Colossus or whatever it is, and they have the, the medical bills and they say it's only worth $10,000 more than the medical bills. And so I want to be able to ha- get be armed and then I want to arm the defense attorney to go talk to the adjuster and say, look, this is not a medical bills case. This is a general damages case. So just ignore the medical bills, waive them, get that out of your equation. This is a non-economic damages case or th- just the LOE, anything like that. I think it's really important because our goal a lot of times here in these MSCs is for us to be able to arm the attorney to go talk to their client, um, especially when you're when you're not in front of the actual client themselves. So it's really important to, to clarify that. Judge Lyons, what do you what what are your thoughts on talking to clients or how you how you deal with the client versus the attorney? Um, I think uh, it's important that before you as the settlement officers uh, speak directly to the client, that you first check with their attorney. Uh, whether or not that attorney wants you to speak directly to the client. They may encourage you, they may not for strategic reasons or for other reasons, Uh, but it is important uh, sometimes I I ask the attorney, is it okay if I address your client? Because as a settlement officer, your job is to help them settle this case. And you need to see and assess for yourself the likability and credibility of that 
a party as a witness. And maybe you can offer a little bit of that if the attorney allows you. So it's uh, before you speak to the client, I always check with the counsel to make sure it's okay. Right. All right. So let's talk about different strategies to kind of, you know, break the log jam, so to speak. So, you know, you guys, they're stuck. What the defense is at 10,000, the plaintiffs at 700,000, really far apart. Judge Lyons, do you have many different tactics you use? What is, what are the different avenues you kind of use to kind of break that up? This is where I call, uh, you have to have a little tool chest of what to pull out at the right time with the right case. So under the hypothetical you gave, it looks like they're very far apart and there's different tools you could use. Uh, before you bring up the big hammer, the mediator's proposal or the brackets, I, I always try to try to get them to come even closer by uh, uh, discussing different creative uh, approaches to settlement. And each case has a very different personality with the clients, with the attorneys, with the issues. So uh, different approaches uh, demand, different cases demand different cases. You know, negotiation is a dynamic process really that demands flexibility to be successful. So you have of uh, tools that you could use and, but they all have to be used very wisely at the right time and uh, in the right way so that they're effective. Um, so uh, I don't know if at this, for example, in the uh, one you gave, the hypothetical you gave, I think they're too far. So a mediator's proposal would not be appropriate. I would think of brackets maybe more. And I don't know, Dan, you, or, or do you? Yeah, sure. That? So um, right. for those, yeah. So for those of you who are not familiar with the word with brackets, when it comes to mediation, I apologize if a lot of you are <laughs> essentially. So, yeah. So the defense is at 10, the plaintiffs at 700,000 and no, they're each going up or down a thousand dollars or 500 bucks. And there's just nowhere to, to, to break it off. What I've seen a lot of good mediators do is they'll say, okay, well, let's let, let's think about doing a bracket. So let's say that if they came up to 200,000, would you go down to 500,000? So that's a proposal. And then the plaintiff's attorney say, yeah, okay, fine. If they come up to 200,000, we'll go down to 500,000. So they're making a pretty big jump. You're making a decent jump down. And then they'll go back. The mediator will propose that to, to, to the defense Say, if, look, if you come up to 200, they'll go down to 500. And they'll say, no, we're not going to do that. If they come down to 300, we'll go to 100. So then they've now proposed a different bracket and they come back to you. But I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mike or Judge Lyons, that what you're really reading there as the mediator, I think, is that where are the midpoints between the two brackets, right? So um, the midpoint between the, uh, the 200, 500, be 350, right? think the math's right. And then the, um, what I say, 100, 300, it'd be 200. So what are the midpoints there? And then you start to see, okay, now we're kind of in the ballpark of where both parties need to be uh, somewhere in the realm. And then you just want to figure out, okay, how do, who's going to make the moves to get there? And Mike, please correct me if I explain brackets poorly, but I'm, uh, you know, any suggestions or advice on bracketing? Dan, I'm just laughing about the math comment, that's all. They say there's three kinds of lawyers, those that are good in math and those that are not. <laughs> you know how to do 40% right. of a number, that's about it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You could do that one in your head. It doesn't oh, easy, make, yeah. It doesn't have to be a round number. It could be $563,212 yeah. at 40%, and you yep. can answer that one in a flash. 100%. <laughs> um, yeah, I, look, I think in a, in a settlement discussion, I think any comment from any party – whether it's the settlement officer, the plaintiff lawyer, the defense lawyer, any comment that has a dollar amount in it is significant. There's always meaning to that. So when you're going on the brackets, yes, you're looking at the, you're looking at the low, you're looking at the high, you're looking at the midpoint. When you get the counter bracket, you're looking at the low, the high, the midpoint, and you're looking at the midpoint of the two midpoints. So I just think every number is significant. When a settlement officer says, well, I'm not sure if I can get this thing over five, but I'm going to try, that over five has paramount importance in the negotiation process. We're studying the eyes. You're looking at the part to see if they're going to blink. 
whether they have a look that no way I'm not, never taking five or a look on their face. If you get me five, we're out of here. You're, you always have to study that. So I think every comment is important. Every move by the, the, uh, the parties is important and signifies something. Judge Lyons, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Uh, brackets are very, very useful. And keep in mind that they don't necessarily have to be suggested also just by the parties. Sometimes you have a very, very contentious uh, case and you can go to both parties as a settlement officer's counsel. Would you both consider if I suggest a bracket? And that may be an alternative. Uh, but yes, I, the way I explain brackets to the clients, really not to the attorneys, is basically when I say, you know, it appears to me that we're not even, if we want to play here, we're not even in the same park. The bracket is to get you in the same sandbox so that you can eventually get to really come to an agreement. But I, I agree with all of your comments. It, it, they have to just be used very carefully and not necessarily just by the parties that you as a settlement officer can suggest one as well. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think the good thing in a way about this being only three hours is you're probably talking numbers pretty quick, right? I mean, you don't have that two hours before you, you get to lunch and you've talked about like your kids for an hour <laughs> with the mediator and heard all about their trips. I mean, that's a good thing. You got it. I mean, you hit it quick, right? Judge Lyons. I mean, are you talking when you get in these, how quickly are you cutting to the chase? You know, well, that's a very, very good question because you only have three hours. Uh, you have to get to cut actually cutting to the chase fairly quickly, but not quickly such that you will short circuit the dance because you cannot short circuit the dance. You have to go through the process of the listening stage, but you do have to get to it so you can get it. And it really depends on the case. I've had MSCs where I don't get to the actual bracket until about 30 minutes before the three hours and others in the first hour. So it kind of varies, but you do have, this is the brackets are a beautiful tool to get parties who can't seem to really, they're so far apart. And you're, if uh, about 30 minutes are left and they're nowhere in the same park, I say, okay, we got to get to the bracket so we can start playing here. So you, you have to be very mindful of the time and brackets are a very good tool to do that. Mike, what, how are you handling it when, you know, one side is making decent moves, but then say the defense or the adjuster is just being super stingy. I mean, will you, will you kind of, will you get on them? Will you say, look, this is going to blow this up. I think you're being totally unreasonable. What's your tactic if the mirroring isn't really working well, you mean matching moves? Yeah. Um, I'm not a big fan uh, of uh, small moves on either side whether I'm a party in a, in a settlement uh, conference or whether I'm acting as the settlement officer. To me, I, I just think it's, it's just a waste of time. And uh, I think that the time in a situation like this should be spent on the non-monetary issues. In other words, let's say, look at the plaintiff, for example. For many plaintiffs, this could be their day in court, so to speak. You've got to let them have that day in court and let them say what they need to say and get off their chest what they need to get off their chest. Spend that time. The defense, if the defendant is there, maybe they have a day in court they need. Maybe it's not the adjuster. Maybe So there's all sorts of other issues that, that need to spend that time. When it comes to the negotiations, there's no excuse for going back and forth a dollar at a time. You got to get to the, you know, using your expression, Dan, you got to cut to the chase. When I'm in a, in a, in a settlement conference and I'm representing the defendant, and I'm with a insurer that's not giving me appropriate moves, or I try to move it along. Even even that respect, I say, "Come on, we got to get we got to get moving here. We got to get to the point." What I find a lot of times is the plaintiff attorney. My impression is they don't want to leave any money on the table, so they go down very slowly. The defense needs to make sure that they don't get to the point where they've run out of their settlement authority, and there's no settlement. They the plaintiff hasn't come down yet because. The defense, they've, they've roundtabled the case already. They have their authority. It's in the file. It's done. Uh, so that number's out there. Is there always a chance later you could go back and call the company and say, hey, we're really, really super close. Just a little bit more will close the deal. Yes, of course. But generally, when you go into a conference like this, the defense dollar is already pre-decided. It's out there and it's done. And it's in the file and the authorities. It's been discussed and that's it. So 
What I'm thinking is, let's get to the point. Let's get moving here. When you do the mirroring, like you said, $5, $5, guess what? The midpoint doesn't change. So in other words, the settlement officer has to go to the parties and say, look, you could do this $5 back and forth all day long. We're still going to get to the same number, 500000 You started at zero. You started at a million. That doesn't matter how many moves you do. 500 is the number. So I think try to speed up to get to that midpoint and then have that conversation. This is why plaintiff's attorneys them. always start at 10 million because of that, of that philosophy. I love it. <laughs> I love it, Mike. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, let's get to five. That's funny. You know, the, the, just keep in mind, though, there is the, the, the backfiring. When you do start too high or too low, I think it sends a really bad message, really bad. When we get a number on the defense side that's way high like that, the offer goes way down. When we get a number that, that, that an impressive first number, we get something that's real. It's very, very uh, meaningful to us. We say, okay, they want to get this case settled. What I find, uh, you know, really, I'll be honest here. What I find is the better attorneys on both sides are the ones that get to the point quicker. I, I have this calculation, the number that starts out versus the number that it settles. And if you're starting out and your ratio is 10 to 1 or 20 to 1, that's not a good sign. If it's 3 to 1 or 2 to 1 or 4 to 1 or 5 to 1, that's much better. And I find that the really, really high level, best attorneys, most successful attorneys, getting the best results for their clients on both sides are the ones where the ratio is pretty tight. That's interesting. I totally agree with that. Judge Lyons, anything else to add there? Yeah, the... Uh, we have a label for the ter for those offers that are unrealistic. We call it the insulting offer because the other side will get or demand either way. The other side will be insulted. And I, you've had, you have to deal with also the culture. We've had uh, clients who, when they demanded a certain amount, were so insulted. They thought it was so outrageous. They just refused to negotiate. So you have to be very careful that that uh, outrageous, unreasonable demand or offer could be so insulting to the other side that it shuts down the negotiation. So be very mindful of that. Yeah. And so, so we're kind of, so you're, you're at a loggerheads in a way, judge Lyons, especially for you, you know, tell us about when you make the call or pull the trigger to do a mediator's proposal and how would you recommend we do it when you have a plaintiff and defense attorney okay. um, kind of at that, towards that end, do you ask them to, to do one? I, uh, some, yes, sometimes I do. And sometimes the parties ask me, let me just clarify for those of you, I apologize for those who you know who, what a mediator's proposal is. A mediator's proposal is a recommended settlement figure by the settlement officer to the parties. And I usually, that's what I call a hammer. It's a very powerful tool, but very dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Because it could end the negotiation period. So use it with great care. And it really should be very thoughtful based on the intelligence you as a settlement officer have gathered from the parties. So, and it, most importantly, it must be timely given. The question you ask when, usually they don't come out until about 1145. It's time for mediator's proposal because you have until noon and this is not moving. Uh, so yes, uh, but if you give it too early, it, it doesn't work. So it's, uh, you have to learn when to give it and how to give it. Uh, and a lot of times, um, if I think, I do not give mediators proposal unless I know that both parties are highly likely to accept it. Highly likely is the standard I use. And uh, rarely have they been denied because I could gather based on the intelligence that who, if they tell me, for example, 50,000 is my last, absolute last. But based on what I've heard through, for two and a half hours, I think they'll go 10 more uh, and vice versa. So you kind of have to be very careful to use them. If they're too far apart, the media proposal will not work. And Judge Lyons, do you do it so it's sort of blind so that yes. they'll, and can you explain how that works? So it's called a double blind, uh, double blind. The mechanics of a mediator's proposal are really quite simple. For example, I'm gonna do one right here. How about that? All right, counsel, we, uh, it appears that the parties are not uh, 
uh, are at an impasse. And uh, if the parties agree, I will propose a mediator's proposal. So I explained to them uh, what a mediator's proposal is so that the parties have the benefit of knowing what that is. And the way I do it is I said, I will give you a number, which I believe the case should settle. The number is not in any way reflective of the merits or lack thereof of the case. It is simply a number where I think the case should settle. And I come up with that number based on what I think both parties, I'm gonna push both of them. I'm gonna push the defense a little bit out of their limit and the plaintiff also a little bit below the limit enough to they could get. So I give the proposal, the mechanics of it. And I said, counsel, this is how it's gonna work. I'm gonna give you a proposal. You both will have 10, 15 minutes. And how do you figure out how much time to give them? It really depends on, to me, on the defendant's ability to contact higher up. Because if you're gonna propose something that the adjuster has to call back east to get that authority, or if you have a public entity that has to contact the committee, you might wanna give them 30 minutes. Usually I give them 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes I give them to the next day at 10 because I knew they had to contact public entity. Uh, on, on Indian. So I said, I'm gonna give you, let's say 10 minutes. Uh, my mediator's proposal, I think this case should settle for 100,000. Council, all I need is a yes or a no. If I get two yeses, it's a deal. If one or both of you say no, there's no deal. And so I will give you time to talk to your clients. 10 minutes, I'm gonna put you in your breakout rooms. And in 10 minutes, and I actually say, okay, for the record, it is now 119. So in 10 minutes from now, uh, you will uh, let me know whether you accept or not. And all again, I need is a yes or a no, no explanation, nothing. Uh, if one or both of you say no, you will not know if the other party said no. So I will not reveal the answer. All I will say is we have an agreement or we do not, period. So then I say, okay, the uh, proposal is a uh, hundred thousand. You go to your breakout rooms. I said, if I if you are done before the 10 minutes, there's a little button at the bottom that says, ask for help because I'm not gonna be in your room. I'm gonna be in the main room in Zoom, in the lobby. So the raise the hand, remember on Zoom only goes to the people in your breakout room. So how are you gonna know, let know the judge, the mediate, uh, settlement officer that you, you agree with the, the 100,000 in Zoom? Okay, the way I do it is I said, you set, click on the ask for help button. And that is a button that will let me know a plaintiff's room needs to see you. Then I go into you. And then the defendant says, and if you do not let me know by the 10 minutes deadline, I will go into your room and say, okay, the 10 minutes are up. Is it a yes or a no? And if they both say yes, they're in separate rooms. Then I don't announce the result, I will put both of them in the main room so that I can both tell them and say, okay, counsel, both parties have responded and there is an agreement. Both parties have agreed. And that's how you deal. If you don't have a, uh, if one or both say no, I still put them in the same room. I said, okay, both parties have responded and there is no agreement at this time. <laughs> there may be one later. So that's how mechanically how I do it. And right. how about do you, how do you handle it, Dan or Mike, with regards to the mechanics? Well, I, I personally think it's really important that the defense attorney and the plaintiff's attorney obviously get on the same page if they're going to present a proposal. Right. Um, and it's just really spending time talking. Like, I think, like, I, I think the same thing. I think you can read the room. You can really figure out what is that number that no one's going to walk away from. Right. And you got to really get to that number. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I think 24 hours, Mike, you would know better. I mean, dealing with adjusters, you have East coast, you right. know, managers, vice presidents, whoever, and then in the carrier, you know, you, you know, it's, it's hard to do it in 30 minutes. I think Mike, you would know better than I do. Right. Yeah. The insurer, the insurers that I work with are located everywhere. Uh, I even have international ones. So I've got one pending right now where we constantly have to call France, uh, to talk about authority and, you know, every Every conversation is, okay, wait a minute, what time is it in Paris? And then we got to figure out what day is it? Wait a minute, it's the middle of the night, they're sleeping over there. So yeah, but all of my insurers are, are all over the United States, different time zones on everything. Uh, the majority are not in California. So we do have to consider that. But, you know, the mediator's proposal, I do it exactly the way Judge Lyons just described. It's just, 
it is a dangerous, there is a dangerous element to it because in my experience, I've never seen a case as a party or a settlement officer that settled for an amount different than the media's proposal. Once it's out there, it is the equivalent of a tattoo. Right. It is going to take a lot to get it undone. It can be undone, but laser is very painful. And uh, the, the, so what I'm saying is I think it's a, it's a permanent it's a permanent thing. It's out there. The plaintiff hears that number and will probably will not settle for any number less. The defense hears that number, and I really doubt they're going to pay any more. So you've got to be really sure about it. But mechanically, exactly the way explained by Judge Lyons. Now, All right. I want to kind of oh, – sorry. Go ahead, Judge Lyons. I'm sorry. If you wait till the next day to get a result, for example, when, when the adjuster is out of town, then you don't have the – breakout room results. What you may do mechanically is you ask the parties to email you, but caution them three times. Do not reply to all <laughs> because <laughs> then otherwise they will know what the result just to send you the results, but you have to give them a deadline. So like, okay, you have till tomorrow at noon to respond just to you, the settlement officer to know yes or no, I accept. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, no, we only have a few more minutes left. I kind of wanted to open it up to uh, Marta, Jeannie, Judge Crowley, any advice, tips? And we're all going to plug this at the very end, how great this is. So go ahead, Marta. I have a couple. Uh, just listening to you guys, thank you so much, uh, the three of you. You did an excellent job, uh, you know, going through some of the mechanics and getting through some tricky issues that, that settlement officers could encounter during an MSC. But just, just so you know, when, when the settlement officer gets assigned a case, they will learn at that point in time who the other settlement officer is. And it's a really good idea to reach out to the settlement officer uh, before the MSC, talk through the case, read the briefs, discuss maybe what could be some, some sticking points. I mean, this is the advantage of this program. You, it's not just a single settlement officer. You have a counterpart on the other side. Jeannie and I, when we worked as uh, settlement officers together, you know, we were calling each other, reading the briefs, you know, talking to each other. We, there was a PowerPoint of different uh, things that one of the parties, uh, I think a video was involved. I mean, we were watching it all and we were talking about the case to see how are we going to get this case resolved. It was really effective. Um, also, I think it's a good idea to exchange cell phone numbers when you're in the, uh, when you're in the actual MSC with uh, counsel for the parties, uh, just in case there's some technological problem. Or, you know, what, what I was, what Jeannie and I were doing sometimes is texting, you know, we would get out of the room so the parties could talk to one another and then they would text us and say, hey, we're ready for you to come back. Just things like that. It's a good idea. It's not necessary. There's other ways for you to communicate that kind of stuff through the chat um, on the actual uh, breakout, it, you know, on the Resolve Law page. But, you know, it's a good idea. And also it's a good idea as a party who is representing um, a litigant at the MSC, talk to, your, talk to your client beforehand, make them aware. You only got three hours here. We cannot, you know, we're gonna, if we wanna get this case resolved, we're gonna have to move very quickly. And Judge Sananian put up uh, on the Resolve Law uh, website, a really wonderful video that kind of talks about the MSC uh, process have them go to the meet, to the party's page on the Resolve Law uh, website and have them click on Judge Sananian's uh, wonderful video and have them take a look at it. So the clients have a really good understanding of what to expect in the MSC. Um, Jeannie, do you have anything else? Yeah, I, I, I do think that um, one of the questions that I have seen posted is what's the difference between the plaintiff settlement officer and the defendant settlement officer? And the difference is the, you know, which side of the V those settlement officers typically practice on and the perspective that they bring in, uh, in the MSC that Marta and I uh, conducted together. Um, I was very comfortable um, being quite direct with plaintiff's counsel and kind of, you know, pressing certain points with them where they, I felt that perhaps that council would be more open um, to the points I was making because I was making them, then maybe they would have been, had Marta been making those points, although she's so professional that I think everyone and anyone will listen to her. 
But I think you use that advantage, right? And same thing with the defense side. There were times when I said to Marta, why don't, you know, I'm going to leave you to press that point um, when it, with the defense counsel. So I think you can play to the strengths of having a plaintiff settlement officer and defense settlement officer to bring both those perspectives and the plaintiff's counsel can be very persuasive in the plaintiff's room and defense counsel and defense room and then vice versa because it's incredibly informative in the defense room to hear some of the plaintiff's arguments that may, may be made and to have an experienced plaintiff's lawyer debunk or you know say I really disagree with um, you know the defense perspective or narrative on this particular point and vice versa in the plaintiff's room. So I think that's one of the reasons why we have a plaintiff and defense settlement officer is that this has uh, this process has a tremendous amount of credibility and different perspectives that are brought to bear. In addition, it's incredibly important that um, from the court's perspective, not I'm not speaking for the court, but in our experience building these programs, it's very important to the court that it be a bicameral effort that we have both plaintiff's counsel and defense counsel involved in this so that the court can feel comfortable um, also being a participant in this process via the order to the MSC. So that's all I have to say. Thank you so all much. All right, and just final thoughts, Judge Crowley. Go ahead, we got a couple minutes left. All right, I thought you guys did a great job in talking about all the practical things. One thing I would add is uh, to ask the parties whether or not, before you get to the very end, are there any other issues besides the numbers that are important to the settlement? Is, is, is there going to be a requirement that the settlement be confidential? Is there going to be a requirement that payment be made in a certain way or within a certain time frame? What's going to happen about the liens? And one of the things you can do is bring that up a little bit earlier because it kind of signals confidence in the fact that the case is going to settle. All right. So when we do reach agreement on the number, what are there any other issues that we need to talk about? Because sometimes you can get the numbers straightened out and then spend a whole nother day arguing over the terms. So you might want to deal with the terms early. I think that's a great that's great advice. Um, any final words? Otherwise, please sign up for this. There's a big backlog. Cases need to get tried. They need to get settled. Um, I know the judges are doing a ph phenomenal job. The plaintiff and defense bar, we're all working together, trying to clear the black backlog, help out all of our clients and uh, get things moving again. All yeah, right. With that final word, Dan, I'm sorry, here I have to jump in and say one quick final word, which is this is an incredible opportunity to me people on practitioners on the other side of the V and to work with, with them. We oftentimes will end up meeting, I'll, I'll meet a defense attorney with whom I was not previously acquainted. But then as I go forward, because I worked with them uh, as a settlement officer, I have a relationship. So it's gonna be easier to call them if they are assigned to a case that I have in the future and you make good friends. So thank you. Judge Crowley, go ahead. This, this program helps the parties because it gets their cases resolved. It helps the court because in the PI hub, reading, the five of us currently have about 9,000 cases. So if we can get it down to 8,999, hoo-hoo. Uh, it, it, it does, as Jeannie says, it, it helps the bar because it, it'll knit the two sides together, develop camaraderie. I can't tell you how much of this, the energy that I see in my court is just Counsel that don't talk to one another, they have no relationship, and it's just firing scud letters back and forth as opposed to having a personal relationship. This program will help develop personal relationships, so I think it's great for the bar. And finally, I think it's great for those of you who are volunteering because it'll give you insights into your own cases and trying to settle your own cases from having that perspective of being the neutral as opposed to the advocate. So for those four reasons, I urge all of you to sign up. Sorry, real quick, Jeannie, someone asked, uh, is this going to expand to employment cases quickly? Yes, we are in the process of expanding this to employment cases, and I'm so excited. I expect and hope to be able to do that um, by, before the end of this year. So stay tuned. All right. With that, thank you all for coming. Great program. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the BHBA. Um, please sign up. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.